Hi there. Uh, my videos uh, of Kathleen Stock on LBC uh, former series, uh, you could watch them as a playlist. Um, I've had to do a little creative editing to make them short enough to upload from my computer, which says there's a 15 minute limit. So they've had a bit of a rejig. I'm sure you can make them make sense. Um, please enjoy. Hi. Welcome back, it's good to see you. So today I wanted to do something a bit different <laughs> because I wanted to go through, um, I listened to Ian Dale on LBC interview Kathleen Stock yesterday and I feel for you Kathleen. Yeah, let's listen together. Up in the next hour, we're going to be talking to Professor Kathleen Stock. I'm going to share a link to the uh, radio show in this video. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to play and then uh, answer the questions. She's joining us to talk about trans rights, gender identity, and she'll tell us how she felt forced to resign her job as one of the country's leading academics. And she'll Lest we forget, Professor Kathleen Stock was a very well respected academic in her field of philosophy, um, where she has published extensively around um, fantasy. And um, the harassment campaign at her workplace, she was not protected by the institution. She was not protected by her union. They allowed things to um, escalate until there were students setting off smoke flares on the campus where she was expected to walk. They were ma like wearing masks and balaclavas, it, a completely hostile work environment. If I were her, I, I would have gone for constructive dismissal. Absolutely no doubt. Also be taking your calls 0345 6060 973. You're listening to LBC, I'm Ian Dale, it's eight o'clock. Um, we're going to do something a little bit different now and talk to someone who's been at the centre of, um, I was going to say a media storm, it's much more than a media storm, it's a storm in the world of um, academia, it's a storm in the world of gender identity. Um, Kathleen Stock joins me, she's described on Wikipedia as a British philosopher and writer. When I ever see that word philosopher, I immediately get intimidated, <laughs> Kathleen, so I'm very intimidated yeah. as, I, as I sit here now. But thank you for joining us. The reason that obviously I want to talk to you is because of what's happened to you over the last year, where um, you were at the University of Sussex, you, I think you've been there for 18 years, have yeah. you? Um, after being at a much better university, the University of Sussex did what possessed you to leave there, I do not know. Um, and and, th and then you you became embroiled in, well, I, I'd rather hear it, you describe it in your own words, actually, because I don't want to put words into your mouth. What what, what happened? Why, but why are you basically here? Well, um, about three years ago, I got, I started to write about um, this idea of self-ID that was coming in. The government had a consultation on it. The idea was that we should change uh, the Gender Recognition Act and the Equality Act at the time to, um, to talk about gender identity as a protected characteristic. And that is roughly the idea that inside you, there's a feeling of whether you're really female or male that may not, or neither, that may not correspond to your actual bodily facts. Um, Lest we forget, uh, the government consultation in response to the proposed changes to the Gender Recognition Act, um, <sighs> the government invited public debate on this subject. It's a subject that affects 52% of the population. It's really important. So while I understand that trans people who have the protected characteristic of gender reassignment uh, have, have rights in our society, the idea that we could translate that into a new protected characteristic of gender identity, which is not definable in law, was always going to fall. So that was being presented as a very good thing that we should just move to self-ID. And I was worried, along with lots of other people, mostly women, yeah. that this would make a difference in practice because 
being a woman, you know, normally as understood in terms of sex, gives you access to changing rooms, uh, domestic violence refuges, uh, rape crisis shelters, prisons and so on, um, on the basis of sex. And the idea was this was all going to be unpicked and changed. At the moment, there's a whole hoo-ha going on about um, police recording um, perpetrators of alleged sexual assaults and even rapes. Rape, which in English law and Scots law is defined as the penetration of the anus, vagina or mouth by a penis. It is a crime that is exclusively perpetrated by men. There are equivalent criminal sanctions for women who commit sexual assault by penetration too. But rape is specifically recognised as part of the spectrum of men's violence against women and children. And um, it's really, it, it's a key issue. And so I started to talk about that. It's a very controversial area, as I'm sure you know. Um, and immediately I started to get flack, basically. And then it sort of escalated and escalated. And then uh, about two months ago, it reached crisis point, pretty much. But it was your decision to leave your job uh, because, I mean, some people have written that you were cancelled, but you kind of cancelled yourself. In yeah, a sense. I don't think I was cancelled either by myself or by anyone else because I, I've i still got, I'm here, aren't I? I'm still talking and I'm still going to keep talking about it. Um, the, the, the real problem with what's happened to me and, you know, there was various uh, big, quite aggressive protests at my workplace about me that caused me to want to resign. The big problem is for everyone else, the people that are left. Um, the women in particular that feel as I do, but feel very intimidated about being able to express their point of view because they're worried that the same thing will happen to them. I mean, let's not forget, this is a very senior person within the institution, within the academy. And, you know, the title of professor is not lightly earned title. It's a title which is hard to earn. This is a woman who was awarded an OBE for services to education. This is a woman who that university should be protective of because this is a woman who, you know, without the backbone of academics, there is no university. So it's absolutely shameful that the university didn't do more to protect her. And I appreciate... Why do you think people... Ooh, I appreciate Professor Stock mentioning the difficulty that women have who are in much more precarious employment. Perhaps they're part-time employed and they're they're on a um, zero hours contract and their bosses can just reduce or increase their hours. Perhaps they've got um, commitments that mean that they're unable to engage in paid work. Maybe they're disabled, maybe they've got caring commitments. Um, these women are incredibly vulnerable to these harassment tactics and we don't have um, a large pension pot. We don't um, necessarily belong to unions. Um, it, it is a very dangerous time to be a woman and speak out about this subject. Whatever their views, I mean, and this I think does happen on both sides of this argument. People get so obsessed by it and become so intolerant of another person's viewpoint, and they use very lurid language to throw at you, mm -hmm. saying that you want to eliminate trans people. Well, yeah. I mean, my, I know what I think that word means. Yeah, and you... I do not want to eliminate trans people. In fact, I'm on record as saying over and over and over again that I'm very happy that the Gender Recognition Act exists as it is, and I'm happy that gender reassignment is a protected characteristic. See, that's where I differ from Professor Stock, because I do not think it's a good idea that we have um, institutionalised a process where people can change their legal sex. I think it's really cruel to tell people that they can change their legal sex because, apart from anything else, it makes people think that maybe they are actually changing sex. Uh, like as if um, changing the sex on a document proves that something has actually literally changed in reality. And I think it's inconsistent with anyone with a materialist grasp of uh, politics or philosophy to... Um, to believe that that is a, a, a panacea for people that are experiencing a dysphoria or an unhappiness about their body. I mean, disabled people experience unhappiness about our bodies, right? So you may have an impairment. Maybe you're a double above the knee amputee and you have to transfer with great difficulty from a wheelchair to use a toilet. You have to have all these adaptations in your kitchen so that you can use a kitchen when you're using a wheelchair 
nobody's saying this person was born in the wrong body and nobody is is lobbying for this person to pay you know a, a proportion less tax because they have less body or you know some other kind of legal change because we recognize each human is a, is a whole and entire spirit and there is nothing shameful about being male or being female these are just the two different types of humans that we have the two sexes it is a function of the homophobia of our society that we created this um, fallacy of changing the legal sex in order for people to marry who were both born uh, male or female so if one of them was trans and had a uh, an amended birth certificate it then may, meant that they were able to uh, get married in a heterosexual um, ceremony this was pre-legal gay marriage in the uk so now that we have legal gay marriage you can be in any combination of male or female and get married as a couple um isn't that sufficient isn't it sufficient it's sufficient for everybody else in the gay community. What What is the difference here? The other thing, uh, which I think, I believe Professor, Professor Stock goes on to mention some other things, so I'll, I'll wait. In the Equality Act, so that basically means trans people cannot legally be discriminated against at work or bullied or harassed. You see, this is the other thing that I think is problematic. We don't have a very solid definition of trans in law. And I think that it would be really, really beneficial to employers, to HR departments, to colleagues, to everybody in society. It would be really, really great if we could get a legal definition of trans. At what point does someone's trans identity need protection in the workplace? So um, if, for instance, a six foot tall banker who is quite senior in the organisation has decided to come into work several days a week wearing a skirt above the knee and fishnets and high heels because he has a gender identity that um, requires him to behave in that way. Should that be a legally protected right? Because from my perspective as a woman and a feminist, I find it incredibly offensive because what he's doing is he's 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 enacting his fetish in the real world. And I'm a big believer that we should be making sure that people's paraphilias are kept where they belong, in the bedroom. Um, you know, your own sex life is your own business. You're an adult, you can do what you like with um, the very famous words of JK Rowling, you know, love whoever will have you. Um, but it's not, a, it's not a human right to force unwilling participants to be bit players in a role play fantasy that you have that involves you being degraded, humiliated, made to submit, force femmed or in any way exhibiting the various um, types of autogynophilia. So, you know, we have got this um, protected characteristic of gender reassignment uh, in order to protect people who've undergone, uh, you know, this extensive process of transition, there's no longer any requirement for anyone to undergo any kind of form of extensive. And it was always, it was always a, a crapshoot because, you know, you can't make somebody change sex. It can't happen. It's not true. Hi, this is the first, the end of the first video on uh, stock on LBC. Uh, watch out for part two.